first, before I get started, I'm sort of curious, uh, how many people here are business owners? And how many people want to start businesses at some point? Okay, it's basically everybody, which is, which is really nice. Um, this, this talk is really for all of you then. Um, it's kind of interesting. We're all in the software business. As someone else, uh, earlier speaker mentioned, we're all in the software business. And um, we all kind of know how to build software. We all know how to kind of improve software. Clearly, some people have different methods. Some people use Agile. No sound in the back? Is that what that, is that, what that means? Yeah, OK. Well, not my problem, I guess. <laughs> so hopefully someone else fix, <laughs> fixes that one. Um, uh, do you want me to wait, by the way, whoever's sort of, should we go? I'll keep going. All right, cool. I'll just, well, I won't yell. All right, so anyway, we, uh, we all know how to make software better. So some people might follow agile principles. Other people might follow other principles. There's lots of different methods and systems and a way to improve software. But we all know that software gets better as you iterate on it. You have an idea. You make a feature. You put a team together. You design it. You mock it up. You might test it. You might show it to customers, or you might just test it internally, and then you ship it, and it's ex it exists in the world. People use it. They give you feedback. You have new ideas. They might share some ideas. It gets better and better and better over time. Version 1.1 should be better than version 1.0, and 1.2 should be better than 1.1. We can mess things up over time by iterating too much, but for the most part, we know that things get better as you iterate on them. But I've always been surprised that that very obvious insight into how to make something better by iterating and thinking about features and improving things and getting feedback in this sort of loop doesn't apply or doesn't, isn't really brought into improving companies themselves. We're always talking about improving the process of making a product, but what about improving the process of making a company? Um, and I think the reason why people don't think about these software principles in terms of building, uh, of improving a company is because people don't think of their company as a product. But I think they should. In fact, I think your company should be your best product. Um, if you make one thing, you always make two. You make your, your product and you also make your company. And the company is the tool that everybody uses together to make something work. So your coworkers, we on? <clears throat> Sweet. Um, I just gave away $100,000 so that people could hear me. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so, uh, um, you know, th th your coworkers. <laughs> is the speed of sound that slow? Is it like, what was, what's going on with that? Latency. Um, so, uh, you know, your coworkers, your, your employees, they all use the company to make the things that we make. So, I think it's a really important idea to think about your company as a product and to think about your company as the best thing that you make. Because when you start thinking about your company as a product, you begin to ask different questions about it. You, you ask things like, is my company usable? Is my company useful? Is my company fast? Is my company slow? What's my company really, really good at? What is it sort of OK at? What does it need to be better at? What does it not have to do at all? Where are the bugs in our company? What are we doing that we're not doing that well? What's difficult about what we're doing? Where are we getting in the way? Where are the bottlenecks? These are the kinds of questions you might ask about software. You know, how do our users feel about it? In this case, it might be employees. These are the questions you ask about software that people should be asking about their own company. And so what I'd like to do is share with you guys a few features of our company, because we've been thinking about our company as a product for about 17 years. We've been in business for about 17 years. We've been iterating on our business every year, all the time. I feel like we're sort of at version seven of our company at this point. Um, and so I want to share a few different features that we've thought are important to the way we work. And not that you should do these things, because I'm sure there's going to be some disagreement among, amongst uh, the crowd about some of these things. But hopefully, it'll give you a sense of what I'm talking about. And you'll be able to start to think about what are the features of your own company. And for those of you who want to start companies at some point, the beginning of a company is a great time to think about these things. Because the longer you exist, the harder it is to change. Things become calcified. You become used to doing things in a certain way. And so thinking about sort of the way the company is built early on is, is, a, is, a, is a great thing. So the first one I want to share with you is um, this idea that seems kind of ridiculous, but in this industry, it's not. Um, we, we decided very, very early on that one of the key features of our business should be that it's very good at making money, which is kind of really ridiculous to have to say that. 
But as we all know in this industry, especially in this zip code, in this region, um, a lot of companies are terrible at making money. In fact, it's one of the worst things that they do. Um, and we didn't want to be that way. We wanted to be in business for a long time. We wanted to sort of chart our own path and be our own kind of company. And so we started to think about if that was a feature of our business, we want to make money. Well, what are we going to have to do to build that feature into the business? Um, just like if you want to say, like, hey, we want to add a calendar to Basecamp or something. Well, what do we have to do to do that? What are the requirements to do that? Um, was that applause? One wants a calendar in Basecamp. I heard that. Um, sorry. So what do we have to do to do that? So, so um, you know, we started thinking about what, what will it take for us to get good at making money? And how do you get good at anything? You practice. You practice over and over and over and over and over. And so how would we force ourselves to practice getting good at making money? Well, we weren't going to raise any money. We were going to bootstrap our business. We decided that we wanted to chart our own course and make our own money and get better and better and better and better at making money so we could stay in business as long and long as long as we wanted. Because as long as you're profitable in the business world, you can stay in business forever. When you're not profitable, and by the way, when I say making money, I should say profit. I'm not talking about revenue. I'm talking about profit. When you have profit, even a dollar of profit, you can stay in business forever. Profit is air, it's food, it's water to a business. And so we wanted to make sure that we were profitable. And to do that, we had to make our own money. So we decided not to raise money. And this is a fundamental decision that we made early on that has a huge impact on how we work. Because a lot of companies that go out there and raise money, what they're really doing is they're practicing getting good at spending money. This is what happens when you have a lot of money in the bank, you practice spending it. And as you probably know, most companies that raise money go off and raise more money because they've spent the other money. We sp a lot of companies get used to spending and spending and spending and spending, and then one day they think they can pull the make money lever, but that doesn't really work that well. Just like if one day you decided that you want to play guitar on stage, like right now, if I got a guitar, I suck at guitar. If I got a guitar right now and started to play guitar, I would suck because I hadn't practiced it. You have to practice for a long time. So this idea that one day you can just pull the lever and be a money-making, or sorry, a profitable business, I just don't buy that in most cases. And we're seeing a lot of evidence that that's not true. So thinking about um, do you want to make, get good at making money or do you want to get good at spending money is a really fundamental thing to, to keep in mind and a feature that we decided early on in our business was important to us. Um, Another feature in our business that we decided was really important to us is that we felt like our business should be able to work at the highest possible level of quality um, with only 40 hours per week per person. So I'm sort of curious, before I go on, I'm curious, how many people here work more than 40 hours a week? Right. More than 60 hours a week. Right. So do you like that? Because I think that's kind of crazy. Um, I think 40 hours is plenty of time to do great work. But you have to do things to make sure that that's possible. So we decided that a feature of our company would be that we can do great work, high quality work, deliver wonderful work to our customers in only 40 hours per person per month. And so to do that, again, what are the requirements? How can we actually achieve that? How can we make that possible? Well, you start to look at how you spend your time. And even more importantly, you start to look at how you spend people's attention. If you've ever noticed when people say they pay attention, the most important thing is to pay attention to that first part of that phrase, pay. Attention costs. And so you have to start thinking about where are people spending it? How are they spending it? How are they spending their time? And when you really look closely at an organization, we sort of have been looking very closely at our company over the past few years, you start to notice the things that take time away from people being able to actually do their work. Because one of the things that's interesting about people who work 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week is that they're not really actually working 60 or 70, 80 hours a week. They're maybe present at the job, but the actual amount of work that they're doing is not 80 hours worth of work. They find themselves, that, and, and they find that they have to do the work early in the morning, or, they, or actually do the actual work early in the morning, or late at night, or on the weekends. And the main reason why is because people aren't able to get work done at work anymore. What's happened is, our days are sort of um, eaten up by meetings. Uh, they are, there's tons of distractions at the office, and, and the modern workplace has more distractions than it's ever had in the past. And so we started to look at, at our office and the way we worked and, and try to figure out what are the things we could eliminate, what distractions could we eliminate to give people back their time and attention so they had 40 hours of their own time rather than 15 hours of their own time and 25 hours of company time. Um, so we don't have any meetings at Basecamp. Um, we have no scheduled daily meetings. We have no scheduled weekly meetings. 
Um, I, I'm actually not being totally honest here. We have one meeting a month that's scheduled. Um, that's it. Everything else, we don't, we, don't, we don't meet. We don't meet in person to talk about stuff. Unless it's just two people. Two people get together. Beyond that, what we do instead is we write things down. We write things up, basically. We post them to Basecamp, and people can read them when they're ready. And this is a fundamental difference between our company and a lot of companies that have a lot of meetings. They get a lot of people in a room together, and they, they talk about stuff that would be better absorbed when people are ready to absorb it versus when the speaker is ready to tell it. And so when, you're, when, you're, when everything is based on when people are willing to talk about things, that pulls everyone else away from their work so they have to listen at that very moment because that, that, that conversation is then gone after that. So we instead write things down and then share things across the company on people's own schedules and own time. And this is a fundamentally different way of working, but it reclaims hours and hours a week. How many hours are people spending in meetings? Oftentimes, it's a few hours a day. Sometimes it's a few, many, many hours a week. And if you really start to add this up, you start to see how much time you can get back. You can still share the same amount of information, but you can absorb, each person can absorb it on their own schedule versus on the company's schedule when you do everything together at one time. So eliminating meetings started to reclaim some time for us, and we found that we could actually save a few hours a week per person where they can just work on that stuff versus, versus having to go to meetings. Um, the other thing we realized is that in a physical space, um, there are a lot of distractions. Noise primarily is a major distraction in, in, in office spaces, um, which is why you see a lot of people wearing headphones all the time. It's not necessarily that they're, they're music fans, although they might be, but they're really trying to drown out other things that are going on. They're basically saying, leave me alone. I have work to do, right? And so we started thinking about how can we eliminate physical distractions in our office? Um, and what we decided was we were going to add a feature to our business, which we call library rules. The idea is that you can walk into any library around the world, anywhere, and um, people know how to behave. It's quiet. You respect people's studying. They're studying, they're learning, they're thinking. And if you do that, and if you walk into a library and you behave that way, why can't offices work that way? Shouldn't people be listening or learning, thinking, working? It's the same thing people should be doing in libraries, should be doing at offices for the most part. And so we implemented library rules, which basically means if you walk into our office, and we have an open, open floor plan, which is typically not a great idea unless you do it this way, um, it will be quiet, like a library. And if you need to talk to somebody face to face, you pull them into a room. We have rooms set up where you can go have a, have a normal volume conversation without interrupting other people. And when you begin to strip out meetings and you begin to strip out physical interruptions in the, in, the, in the business, you end up claiming more hours for people, right? So we don't have to pack on 50 hours a week. Now we actually have maybe 43 or 44 hours a week um, at this point after we've eliminated these other things. And the last thing we've been really working very hard on eliminating, iterating again through this problem, is, uh, is virtual distractions which are primarily uh, notifications um, and most real-time communication. I know there's a, obviously a very strong trend right now of everyone taking everything to real-time. Everyone's chatting in real-time, real-time, real-time. Um, if you really step back and, and look at the things that are being discussed in real-time, most of those things have nothing to do with right now. They'd be better written up and then absorbed later when people are ready versus being pulled, aside, pulled away from what you're doing to have to listen to what someone is saying right now when now has nothing to do with it. You'll see that um, probably many people in this room have a chat room of ch or a chat app of some sort open with a bunch of unreads, and you're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth all day. This is incredibly distracting. And if you don't work this way, you get a whole bunch of extra time back. And what's more important is that the time you get back is a long, uninterrupted stretch of time like, when's the last, raise your hand if you've had four hours to yourself at the office anywhere in the past five years. Very few hands. Isn't that obscene? Isn't that ridiculous that you go to work and you don't have four hours to yourself to work? That you're constantly pulled away from your work by all sorts of things that have nothing to do with you right at this very moment. Very few things really need to be discussed right now. And um, so we've been working very hard on, uh, we use real-time communication for all the fun social stuff, but nothing important in our company happens in chat rooms. If it's important, it's written up, 
in a long form in Basecamp where you can go check it out and read it later when you're ready, not when someone else wants you to hear it right at this very moment. So these are some of the techniques we've been using to reclaim people's time and attention so they don't have to spend 40 or 50 or 60 or 70, I should say not 40, but 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 hours working when a lot of that actually isn't work time, it's distraction time. And the last, the last feature I want to talk about really quickly, I have about a minute here, is um, remote working. So we decided that we want to be able to hire the best people we possibly can in the world. Now, a lot of companies say this. Of course, every company says they want to have the best people in the world. But what they really mean is we, they want to have the best people in their neighborhood. Because a lot of companies restrict their hiring to within a 30-mile radius of where their home office is, where their headquarters are. And we decided that that's not the best way to find the best people in the world. The best people in the world are all over the place. The chance that they're within a 30-mile radius of your office is pretty, pretty rare. Some of them are but many of them are not. And so one of our best programmers lives outside of Phoenix, and another one of our best designers lives outside of Oklahoma. One of our best customer service people lives in a farm, a fifth generation farm in Tennessee. We have another employee who's a wonderful programmer who lives outside of uh, Toronto in a big rural stretch of land. We hire anywhere, anybody, doesn't matter what their role is. My business partner and I barely see each other. He lives in Malibu half the year and Spain the other half of the year. I live in Chicago. Before this, he used to live in, 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 uh, in Copenhagen. So we barely even saw each other. And we decided very early on that if we want to hire the best people in the world, we have to be honest about that, that a feature of our company should be that if you're great, you can work here. You don't have to move here or move somewhere. And also, if you want to move somewhere else because something else happens in your life, you don't have to be pulled away from your job or lose your job because your spouse or your partner or you want to go to another city. So these are some quick examples of some of the features that we built into our company that we're constantly iterating on to figure out how we can work better. And um, granted, I know some of these things are, are, are not things that many people here might agree with. Um, but hopefully, the idea and the principles around thinking of your company as a product and thinking of the things you do as features and iterating on those over time and not letting your company be stuck basically at 1.0, because we know software that's stuck at 1.0 that doesn't change is never going to get better. So a lot of companies out there are stuck at 1.0, and they don't constantly iterate on improving on, on how they work. So I hope this was useful at some level, even if you disagree with some of the tactics. Hopefully, you can find some that work for you. And uh, thank you very much for listening.